Hello there, welcome back to the channel. And in this video, I'm doing something of an analysis, which has always bugged me. And it is to do with what is actually technically my favorite first officer from Star Trek, and that is Commander William T. Riker. And specifically, I'm going to be doing a bit of a comparison between the Riker we had in Generations and the Riker we had in Insurrection. Three movies apart, can canonically, not that great a span of time. But the man we had in Insurrection was a lot more of a warrior than the man we had in Generations. And I'm going to explain my reasoning behind it. Why, if the Riker from Insurrection was the Riker who was in command of the Enterprise D in Star Trek Generations, we never would have got the E. The D would still be prominent. It would still be the flagship of Starfleet and the Federation. And here's the reason why. Before we get into it, please like, share, subscribe, and comment down below. And also, please check out my other channels that are listed in the description below. Nerd World Films, Nerd World Order, and Nerd World History. All of which require more subscribers and views. All appreciated. And with that, let's begin. Okay, so to start with my thinking on this, we are going to be comparing two battles that take place in the movies. One, the battle between the USS Enterprise NCC-1701D in the Viridian system against a Klingon D-12-class bird of prey, the former under the command of Commander William T. Riker, and the latter under the command of Lursa and Betor of the House Duras of the Klingon Empire. The other battle is between the USS Enterprise NCC-1701E in the Briar Patch against two Sona battleships. And these battles could not be more different. Now, we'll start with a basic breakdown of the Battle of Iridia 3. The Enterprise D has ended up in orbit of the planet in a bit of a standoff with the Klingons. Now, the Klingons figure out a way to bypass the shields of the Enterprise D, and that's a big deal because one of the things about the Enterprise D, in fact, the Galaxy class starship in general, is it's a bit of a glass cannon, and I know that can be a harsh statement. But let's face it, look at how it did against the Jem'Hadar. These ships, if you can get through their shields, they're not built for war. They're covered in windows, that deflected ish is a big obvious target, the nacelles are not armoured. And although it's a structurally strong vessel, the alloys that it's made from are very strong. And it said, right, the stronger the alloy, the thinner it has to be to keep mass and weight down, yada yada yada. That's all fine. But there comes a point where you've still got a tissue paper thin hull, basically, no matter how strong it's made from against enemies that are just as advanced as you are, so their weapons can breach your hull pretty damn easily. But the Enterprise D had brilliant shields. Not only as the flagship of the Federation, but also as a Galaxy-class starship, these vessels had famously strong shields. So this bird of prey being able to get through them was a big deal. But not that big of a deal. This is the Enterprise. Not only is it a Galaxy-class starship, one of the most powerful in the fleet, but it's likely top of the range Galaxy-class. Starfleet's going to keep its flagship of all of its vessels in absolute premium condition. This vessel was still armed to the teeth with incredibly powerful phasers, cluster firing photon torpedo launchers. That torpedo launcher in the neck of the Enterprise could fire five torpedoes at once. It was a cluster firing array. It was not just a single missile port. It was five. So we know the Enterprise from previous battles with the Borg could unleash absolute hell on Earth if it wanted to. And what does Riker do in this battle? He realises they've cleaned some bridges shields. He's taking some damage. He's up against the gravity well of a planet. So he makes the very good command decision to break orbit. To get away from the planet. Because being trapped in the planet's gravity well is a bit like be fighting with your back against the ocean. You have nowhere to run. You've got to get away from that so you can manoeuvre. So you don't crash into the planet as they ultimately do. But... The Enterprise somehow doesn't manage to get away. Now we could assume that maybe there's some damage to the engines. But Riker fires the phasers once. The immensely powerful, heavily armed ship fires its phasers once at that Klingon bird of prey. A bird of prey that has been demonstrated over and over again. No match for a Federation starship. None at all, especially a galaxy class. It should be able to wipe the floor with it. Shields are not. He should have been able to destroy that bird of prey faster than it could inflict enough damage on the Enterprise to actually destroy it. That's the basics of it. Yes, the Klingons could penetrate the shields. Yes, they hit them with a few torpedoes and some disruptor fire, and the Klingons did what the Enterprise are doing. They unleashed hell 
on the Enterprise. Absolutely annihilated it. But look, they still didn't really manage to destroy the ship. Not ultimately. It wasn't their weapons fire that directly destroyed the ship. It did damage to critical systems that led to the ship's destruction, yes. But it wasn't the cumulative effect of their weapons. That tells you how much weaker they are. The Enterprise D, although in an alternate timeline, was shown to be able to destroy a bird of prey just with its phasers. Not Forget its torpedoes, and that's in a battle scenario. It was also shown to be able to do this in another episode. So, where was all that? Why, did he, why didn't he? Now, you jump forward a few years to the Briar Patch. This battle would go rather differently. The Enterprise E, we should also point out, is a completely different class, not just literally, but as in caliber, of Starship to the Enterprise D. The Enterprise D was built as the apex of Federation vanity, on the end of a decades-long, almost century-long era of unprecedented peace. Yes, the Federation had multiple wars, which one day I'll probably cover. War, wars like the Border Wars of the Cardassians and various other conflicts. But the Enterprise-D was not developed during those wars. It was not developed as a response to those wars, and those wars were still limited. The Enterprise-D was a luxury liner in space with guns. And as I said, immensely good shields and weapons were powerful, but it was not a warship. Warships do not have children aboard. It has soldiers. It has officers, it has commanders on board it. It does not have children and barbers and other such people. At least it will very rarely have them. The Enterprise E, totally different story. The Enterprise E is a sovereign class starship. This is a battle cruiser first and an exploratory vessel second. This is a ship built after first contact with the Borg. It is built as a consequence of escalating tensions with the Romulans. It is built after destabilizations of the Klingon Empire. It is built after contact with the Dominion. This ship is not a friendly starship. Not if it doesn't want to be. It is a well-armed cruiser. It is highly maneuverable, very fast, faster than the D. But all that considered, it's still another command of the same man. Now, it was also up against two immensely superior starships in superior, that they were superior to the D-12-class Bird of Prey. The Sona battleship was armed with photon torpedoes, disruptors, and isolytic warheads. These were basically a subspace weapon that the Federation had banned because they were unpredictable. The Federation wasn't inherently against such weapons. Starfleet had used weapons of mass destruction of one form or another in the past. There's even an argument made that it's a standard stock. Photon could be considered a weapon of mass destruction by 20th and 21st century standards, but not by 24th. Isolytic weapons were dangerous because they were not, not because they were powerful, but because they were hard to control and they had often had unforeseen consequences of their use. As a result, Starfleet banned them because they were dangerous. So, and I didn't give a toss about that, so they had them. Now it was up against two of these ships, vessels that were 600 meters across, more or less, almost as big as the E, and almost as well armed. One on one, the Enterprise E was a far superior ship to these, even before its refit by Nemesis, but it wasn't a straight match of them. It was also in a situation where it was in a region of space that wasn't suitable to it. It had issues with the engines and the and the Bussard collectors and those things. It basically wasn't refitted to work inside the Briar Patch because the area was all full of, you know, radiation and gas and shit that were clogging up the engines. So, the circumstances are different. The enemy is different. These aren't Klingons. Sona are inferior warriors to Klingons for a start and overall less dangerous. But, these ships are more powerful than a bird of prey, as is the E stronger than the D. Now this would be made famous by the so-called Riker maneuver, where he would use the local gases, suck them into the ship, and stuff them down the sonar's throat. He would release them from the engines, and then ignite them. He would go all out, engaging, maneuvering, firing all weapons, utilizing every element of the Enterprise. It's the, the well-trained crew how you know disciplined they are. It used the ship's maneuvering abilities, the ship's advanced shields, its weapons, its advanced tactical systems, all to its advantage, all to engage these two very powerful ships that could have easily destroyed the Enterprise. He even used the ship's warp core as a defense system against the isolated weapons used against him. Everything here was creative, innovative, and 
out of the box thinking against a superior enemy that should, by all rights, have simply obliterated the Enterprise. Yeah, the Enterprise probably could have took on one of these ships and come out on top, but two in a region of space where, it, where they were they were basically almost at home field advantage. He shouldn't have won. He was able to destroy one, disable the other. All by using his wits, their training, their discipline. They never ran, they didn't cower, they didn't worry they were going to die. They had a mission to perform. The ethics and the, everything of the Federation was at stake here. They weren't going to lose, and they knew it, ultimately. And that was a very different Riker to the Riker that was aboard the Enterprise D in the Viridian system. And here's my basic theory. He's matured as an officer, certainly, but Riker was a fantastic soldier. He often shown himself more than capable of handling himself in a tactical situation and thinking on his feet. Just like this, he could think outside the box and he was an aggressive officer. I don't believe for one second he simply panicked because the shields were being breached. He may have worried for his crew. He may have been thinking that there were children aboard and he needed to get the Enterprise to safety first and foremost. He also was clearly not as familiar with the D-12 class as he had to refer to Worf for tactical information about it. If this had been a Borel class or a Cavort class or even one of the cruisers, he probably would have known more as he had more experience with them. But the D-12 was an older ship. But that again is another point. It's an older ship. The Enterprise, state of the art, brand new. D D-12, older ship, decommissioned, spare parts going to be a problem. That ship's probably got a lot of custom upgrades. Its weapons, everything, are going to be behind the Enterprise. They should have won. The only thing I can conclude is that the Riker of Generations and the Riker of Insurrection were almost different men, not in the same way that he was different to Thomas Riker, but he had, by this point, been ser in the reading system, he'd been serving aboard a luxury liner. Yeah, they'd had their fights, they'd had their encounters with the Borg and all such things, but nothing like this. Nothing that was this bad and there was no Picard to fall back on. I don't believe he panicked. The man's awesome. He's the best first officer in the fleet. By far. Take that, Chicote. But in this situation, I think his first impulse was to run, when his first impulse should have been to fight. By the time we get to insurrection, he's learned from that experience. Starfleet teaches you to save lives, preserve the ship. He had learned that sometime by, by losing the Enterprise D, by losing that battle in that respect, he had learned the lesson. You don't do that this time, no. You stand, you fight, not because it's just the right thing to do, not just because your crew is at stake, but it's because it might be the best way to save them and more lives in the long run. You don't... You run from a fight if the long-term goals are only to save your crew. If that's it, then maybe run. But when there's more at stake, you stand, you fight, because... Living to fight another day at the expense of others is not the Starfleet way. And I think by insurrection he'd learnt that, which is probably why it's a good thing he would go on to become the captain of the Titan when he did. At a later time when he was already an established seasoned and intelligent officer who had already learnt these hard lessons. And that's my dog now just licking my knee. Hi. You after. You've been fed. Only your lips at me. You're eating me. God, you're greedy. Anyway, tell me in the comments below your theories. This always just bugged me as a little thing in the background of Star Trek. Every time I watch Star Trek Generation, which is not one of my favorite Star Trek movies, which refer to my um, nerd talks on my sister channel, Nerd World Films, where I've covered that movie, it's not one of my favorites. And that scene in particular always bugged me because I just didn't understand why the Enterprise just didn't keep firing. I always thought this about Starfleet in a lot of battle situations. I get they don't like to fire first. They don't like to use overkill. But seriously, your ship's in danger. There are more lives in danger. Millions of people on the planet's surface. You need to destroy that enemy ship. They're trying to kill you. Giving them quarter, this isn't the time for honor in that regard. Fight or flight. And I think in these in these earlier battles, Riker tended to war, lean towards flight more than fight, even though I think he was a more aggressive officer. But again, tell me in the comments below your thoughts, your theories. What am I missing? Am I missing something about the battle that I'm just not seeing? Am I giving him too much credit from insurrection? As I said, this is just something that annoyed me when watching Generations and when I watch Insurrection, which again is not one of the best films, but these two scenes 
juxtaposed next to each other. Do sort of scream, what the fuck? Seriously, what the fuck? Anyway, for me, that's all to the end of the video. Like, share, subscribe, comment down below, and thank you for watching. Bye bye.